I'm recently returned from my trip to the Southwest Kiln Conference, which was held in Blanding, Utah this year. Along the way, I collected some clay, I fired some pottery, and I got to talk to a lot of really good potters. So, in this video, let me take you with me on my trip so you can kind of experience the adventure we had getting there, enjoying the conference, as well as getting back. The Southwest Kiln Conference is the event of the year for primitive potters and pottery replicators here in the Southwest. It's held in a different location every year. Last year it was in Silver City, New Mexico. This year, as I said, it was in Blanding, Utah. So Blanding, Utah is really on the opposite end of the Southwest for me. It's a long drive. In preparation for that, when I came back from Montana this summer, I left my travel trailer up in Northern Arizona. That way I wouldn't have to transport it quite as far when I was going to Utah. So the first part of my trip, my wife and I traveled north to pick up our trailer in Concho, Arizona. So the trailer hitch to my travel trailer uses these things called weight distribution arms. These distribute the weight of the trailer over the length of the vehicle so that some of that weight is actually on the front tires and it's not all on the back tires. And because I have a half ton pickup, these are really important. Well, when I dropped my trailer off there in June, I accidentally left one of the arms sitting next to my trailer. So I called the guy at the storage yard and had him go pick it up. And I had him put it away for me. Now, that guy from the storage yard is always there, like seven days a week, eight hours a day. So I really didn't think it was gonna be a problem. But when we got there, he wasn't there. We called the number, no answer. And so we sat around and waited for hours. Finally, he called back. His wife was in the hospital in intensive care. He said he would be back at the end of the day to lock the gate to the storage yard. So he finally shows up about 5.30, gives us our arm, and we're on our way. So the first night out, we planned to stay the night in Gallup, New Mexico at an RV park. But we had a surprise when we got there because while our camper was in storage in Concho, it had picked up a mouse. And that mouse had pooped all over everything, the floor, the countertops, our bedding. And so before we could go to bed for the night, we had to clean the kitchen, we had to clean the floor, and we had to launder all of our bedding. And so we didn't get to bed until a little late that night which got us started a little late the next morning. So the next morning, with our camper relatively clean and the mouse still on board, we headed north to Blanding, Utah. But because we didn't get out of Gallup until after 10 o'clock in the morning, because of our late night the night before, we didn't get all set up in Blanding until, say, two or three o'clock in the afternoon. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to go to the Anazazi Heritage Center in Dolores, Colorado on Wednesday afternoon, but because I didn't get set up until three in Blanding and it was still an hour's drive to the Anazazi Heritage Center, that didn't happen also. So with the rest of our time, Tanya and I went on a hike to explore some nearby ruins there in Blanding. I think this is called the Ruin of the Five Kivas and it's really cool and not a bad little hike if you're in Blanding. The next day, Thursday, we planned on cutting firewood in preparation for the conference. So Thursday, a group of conference attendees got together with our chainsaws and pickup trucks and went out and cut firewood. Now it takes a lot of firewood to do one of these conferences. We hauled maybe three pickup truck loads of wood, which is quite a bit. So Friday morning was the real start of the conference and people started arriving from all over. And Friday morning there were lectures. There were three different lectures that were given in the conference room at the edge of the Cedars Museum. Hey, welcome, welcome, welcome. This is one of my favorite times of the year. Just a beautiful time to be in this part of, of our country, but it's also, this is a great time to just gather up with people and just reunite and, and explore this passion that we all have, this curiosity that we have. Some of these lectures that were given Friday morning are online. So if you're interested in a deeper dive on this subject, check the doobly-doo. I'll put links to any of those lectures that are available down there. After lunch, there were demonstrations in the courtyard of the museum. There were demonstrations on corrugated pottery making, flint napping, and I did a demo on yucca brush making and painting. He came to the to Poi Cultural Center and he did, he did a little workshop on the replication of the trench kiln. My name is Wayne King and I'm from Cortez, Colorado. Is it shirred or shard, Wayne? Shirred. What is the secret to getting good organic paint black? Um, Mount Marillonite. The other cheating trick is to add a little mineral paint to your organic paint. Mm -hmm. That's fudging. <laughs> all right, and, and of all the prehistoric types, all the types of pottery in the prehistoric Southwest, which one is the apex? Which is the ultimate? 
It's the sit, finest. Sit yacht gig. All right. That's all there is to it. Thank you, Wayne. Cool. Saturday is when the real activity of the conference gets started because that's when we fire the pottery. Now, the weather forecast had said there was going to be wind on Saturday. And so those of us that were firing were a little concerned about that wind, especially me because I fire on the surface of the ground. Those that are firing in trench kilns, they can handle a little more wind because those pots are a little protected down in that trench. And so I wanted to get a real early start. So I got started way before the sun came up, around 6.30 in the morning. And you can see here, we're getting those fires going, starting those primary fires, preheating the pottery, getting it ready to fire. And when that was done, we stacked the pottery over the coals, fired it up, and I was done with the surface firings by about 10.30 in the morning. So there were two main surface firings. One was for painted and polychrome pottery, and the other was for plain ware. The difference was, when you have decorated pottery, you generally don't want a lot of fire clouds on it. That is the, the carbon blemishes that are on the pots. But the other firing, when you have plain ware, when you have micaceous ware, a lot of times you want fire clouds to give it character, to give it some interest. And so in that firing, we were actually trying to encourage more fire clouds. I'm not sure the total number of pots fired, uh, but there was quite a few. Eric Bender from the Denver area. All right, uh, is it shard or shard? Sure. Uh, what is the one secret for getting good organic paint black? Yeah, the one tip right, you'd give somebody. Right the right slip. And um, of all the types of prehistoric pottery in the Southwest, what's the best? What's the apex of Southwestern prehistoric pottery? It's corrugated. Corrugated. All right. That's one I hadn't had before. Thanks, Eric. That's all there is. But the big show for Saturday morning was that trench kiln. I'm not sure how many pots were in there. But that was a lot of pots, that was a big firing. And Kelly Magleby was in charge of that firing, with some help from others. The pots are stacked around the fire and preheated. She preheated for hours in this case. I never preheat that long. This went on for, I don't know, two or three hours for preheating. And while that was going on, it actually started to rain a little. And so they put all these cover sherds and bits of tin over the pots to try to protect them from the rain while they were preheating. Once the primary fire was done, the coals were raked out along the bottom Kiln furniture was put on top of those coals and the pots were carefully stacked in the fire and then cover shirts were put over the top of that. And then after the pots are all stacked carefully in that trench, the secondary fire is built over the top of all of that and lit off. And when you're firing this many pots in a hole in the ground, it takes a pretty big fire to fire them on. And by this point in the morning, the wind was starting to pick up. So you can see this fire is really raging. So while this trench kiln firing was going on, there were also a couple of other firings that were happening. Kyle Cook did another surface firing and a charcoal firing in another portion of the firing yard. But by the time the trench kiln firing was getting going, my surface firings were already all wrapped up. So as you can imagine, this trench kiln firing process goes on for hours. After that secondary fire has all burned down to coal, and there's nothing flaming or smoking left. Then they come back with shovels and they put that earth back over the top of all those coals and smother that fire. This prevents oxygen from getting to the pots as they cool, which keeps those whites super white and allows those organic blacks to stay super black. Now the timing of this step is critical. Too early and your pots will come out dark, kind of carbony looking. Too late and you'll burn out that organic after the smothering, everybody goes away and just leaves it until Sunday morning when it's opened. Uh, Leander Gridley, I'm from Mancus, Colorado, right near Mesa Verde National Park. All right, uh, Leander, do you say shard or shard? It's so like getting in the field this year, that's a good problem. I say shard, the English say shard. <laughs> All right. Um, what's, what's, a, what's the secret to getting good organic paint black on pots? Um, I think it's... Uh, Getting that uh, organic paint, be it bee weed or tansy mustard, uh, boiled down to a syrup and then uh, letting it dry 
as long as possible. And and um, the last question is, um, you know, of all the prehistoric pottery in the Southwest, what uh, what's the what's the best? What's the finest one that you know you like the most? The basket maker three uh, pottery with big oils that they made, and uh, and some of the earlier designs are really. Um, some of my favorites. It's a tough question to answer. <laughs> it is. Well, thanks, Leander. I appreciate that. Thank you. On Saturday afternoon, there were a number of activities around the conference. There was a lot of just socializing and that sort of thing. There was also a group that went out around this time to collect clay from some local areas. Saturday evening was the catered dinner, and they served Navajo tacos for that. And this was also another great time to socialize, to talk to people you hadn't seen in a while, to share ideas and resources. So, and then at the end, after the dinner, we did the trade blanket. And that's when people bring things to trade and there's a lot of fun involved in that. Saturday was a full day. I started at about 6.30 in the morning and we didn't finish with the trade blanket until about 8.30 at night. So it was a very full and exhausting, but fun day. Uh, Bill Warner from Chandler, Arizona. <laughs> Is it shirred or shard? Yes. <laughs> uh, when it comes to when it comes to getting good organic paint designs on pottery, what's the trick? Uh, One trick, not right? overcooking it. Okay. And uh, when it comes to prehistoric pottery in the Southwest, what type is the apex, the the ultimate? Oh boy, there's too many. There's ten apices. <laughs> too many good ones. All a right. lot of people say Tularose, some people pay, say this, some of the Salado uh, tricolor, yeah. polychromes, some people, uh, but they're all, each one of them, some of the Hohokam materials, they all have their own high points. For sure. Thank you. Yeah. Now Sunday morning, we all got up early ready to open that kiln and see how the pottery turned out. So first they have to take off all the overburden, that is all that soil, they have to remove the cover shirts and kind of expose the pottery. And then slowly they start pulling the pots out and seeing how they did. This was a very successful trench kiln. Everything came out really nice. Right up and ha, up and hurl, hurl. If you if you can touch your pot, if you if it's not too hot to touch, you can hold it. You can take it. So any with organic paint are gonna have an ash layer where it looks white, like here. So you'll have to clean it off in order to see the black, the black underneath. <laughs> it looks to me like the kiln masters did their job really well. Really well. I think let's give an applause to all that hard work. But I, I think this this black on white jar right here is a great um, a reflection of that black on white that you're going for in these firings, and that just <coughs> makes me so happy. Yeah, do an initial yeah, photograph yeah. down here uh, using the nice this way, Rod. kind of hill cut as a backdrop. Is that yours? Because uh, we know some people can't stick around right here. Okay. Pretty, pretty good, good there, buddy. Cool. Mountain lion motif. Who's this? Not Who made this uh, round bottom Jaguar AG mug? AG mug. Ada. No, oh, no, that's from the other one. metal that I bit the end. Oh. And, and I turn it, it and it starts chipping out and it's turning. We call it chattering. Oh, yeah. It makes a nice texture. Yeah. It came out real nice. Oh, that's like perfect black. Isn't yeah. It? And what are, the, uh, what are the clays you're using here? Um, so this clay is one that Bob gave me, and Cannonball White, and then a bee plant, cool. just bee plant on it. Really nice. Oh, thanks. I don't think there's even a, is there even a fire cloud on them? Uh, no, they're they're they're, just they're pretty clean. Yeah. yeah. They're great. Yeah. Thanks. There's probably a lot of spread all around all of that. Oh wow. Yeah.
Didn't that turn out great? That yeah. is amazing. I don't think I can that's mine. That's mine. Who's, uh, fancy, uh, wiener dog is this? That's mine. It's mine. Who's it mine? Andy. Iron Ock, can I touch it? Is it hot? The handle's not. Yeah, all right. My pot that I had in that fire was the sheep effigy. Now, this was painted with iron oxide paint, so it was an experiment for me to see if I could get a reduced iron in that trench kiln. And as you can see, it's dark. It's darker than it could be. It's not a bright red as it was when it was painted on, but uh, it is a little on the brown side, so not really good reduced iron black. So I'm gonna refire that sheet pot and hopefully get it to reduce to a good black in a future firing. My name's John Olson, I'm from Boulder, Utah. Is it shard or shirred? <laughs> shirred. What is the one secret to getting good organic paint? Clay. The clay. Clay type. Mm -hmm. And. From the ancient southwest, of all the types, what type of pottery was the apex, the finest of prehistoric pottery? Uh, in my opinion, the Virgin Canta. Right. That's it. Thank you, John. The weather had been a really squirrely. Saturday, as I mentioned, there had been wind, there had been rain, uh, and it had kind of threatened to rain all afternoon, off and on. And then Sunday, again in the morning, it was raining off and on. And so we hurried up and took our group photo and then most people went home. My wife and I, because we had our camper, we stayed Sunday night. So Monday we traveled south back to Gallup, New Mexico where we had spent the night on the way up. Leaving our trailer in the RV park in Gallup, we traveled further south to collect some of this yellow clay. And as you can see, there's this sharp escarpment out there. And in this bluff, this little escarpment, the edge of a plateau, uh, there's a lot of layers of clay. Some of them are gray, some of them look like they might even be coal, they're very black, uh, but some of them are yellow like this. And so I collected about three different sources of this yellow material, and I've been busy in the last few days processing this, trying to get it to a usable consistency. And one of the things I'm doing with it is I've got this test pookie, and I've painted it with these yellows, these three yellows that I collected in New Mexico, but also some other yellows. I've got a yellow that somebody sent me from Montana, I've got some yellows that I get up on the Mogollon Rim in central Arizona. And I've also got a couple of green clays, one from Utah and one here from here locally in southeast Arizona. So I've got a bunch of different green and yellow clays painted on the inside of this pookie. And I'm hoping to fire this in the next day or two so I can learn how they perform in a firing and compare the colors on all of these different yellows. We also stayed another night in Gallup and on the next day we drove down to Acoma Pueblo. Acoma Pueblo claims to be the longest inhabited settlement in North America. They say that their ancestors moved to that mesa top in around 1100 AD. So they've been there a long time. And although most of them don't live on that mesa full time because there's no electricity or telephone or running water up there, many of them still maintain their homes up there. So they go back for different festivals and dances that they have. It's a really fascinating place. This church was built in like 1640 or something. And it also is kept maintained even though there are no longer regular services held there. So the next day, this would have been Wednesday at this point, we left Gallup, traveled south to Snowflake, Arizona, where we had to pick up our dog. So my dog Delilah had been down in Snowflake being bred. She came into heat just shortly before our trip. And so we went down there and picked her up. We were glad to see her, we'd been missing her, but it was nice also not to have to worry about her while we were on our trip. We could enjoy the kiln conference knowing that she was in good care. While I was down there, I also collected some more clay. This is the clay that I used to make Salado Polychrome and other organic painted pottery. I collected another bucket while I was there since it's in the area. Interesting. Look at this. See that? Look at that. That's interesting. Look up here, it's doing the same thing. You see it? Okay, let's take a second to address the elephant in the room, or more accurately, the mouse in the camper. On our first night in Gallup, we put out some glue traps that we already had. When we got up in the morning, the glue trap had been moved, but there was no mouse attached. But after that, we never heard or saw any sign of the mouse. The whole time we were in Blanding, we kind of assumed the mouse had either died or left because there was no evidence of him. But then, when we returned to Gallup several days later, my wife had a biscuit that was left over from dinner sitting here on this table and when we got up in the morning, it was partially eaten, so we knew the mouse was still around. 
At that point, we went to Walmart and we bought some traps that we baited with peanut butter and set on the floor. And so we thought that'll get him for sure. But over the next couple of days, those traps were left set and the mouse never touched them. And yet during that time, we were woken up in the night several times hearing the mouse chewing on things. So he was around, but not touching the traps. Then we thought, well, when we get the dog, the dog will definitely either catch the mouse or drive it away. But we never had any more incidents of the mouse after we picked up the dog. So we're still left wondering where the mouse is and whether or not it's still here. And then on Thursday, we made the long drive. I think it was like seven hours of driving with a trailer behind, you know, so it's a lot of work. It's a lot of stress uh, from Snowflake, Arizona, all the way back to Tucson. And because we were up at higher elevations up in northern Arizona, northern New Mexico and Utah, the temperatures were like in the 70s, maybe in the 80s. When we got back to Phoenix and Tucson, it was like 95, 96. And so it was a big change to go from those nice cool weather back to almost summer temperatures down here. So the Kiln Conference was a great experience this year. Got to fire some pottery, got to do some experiments, collected some clay. And as far as I know, that mouse may still be in my trailer. So I still have that to deal with. I appreciate you coming with me today. I'll catch you next time. I used the term that it was, a, it was acting like, um, like playing cards. Yeah. Look at that. Look. I'm selling that.